Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. Lord, that it guides us in the truth, the reality of things and an understanding. And Lord, today, it just seems to stand in such contrast to the way of the world. So Lord, teach us your ways, not only in knowledge, but also by your Holy Spirit to live out that truth. Lord, the things we learn today, uh, Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit will speak to us individually, corporately, but also what we learn, that you'll show us how to walk in it, to become part of our life, in your wonderful name. Amen? Amen. So we'll be on the section in Acts chapter 2, verse 40 to 47 for quite some time. And today I'm fairly confident that I should be able to get through Acts chapter 2, verse 40 and 41, which is why I cut a lot of material out of it (laughs) so that I could do that. And you'd be surprised because what happens is something comes up uh, in the text that you read, but you've got to go out and have a look at it through Scripture and then come back to understand what this is actually saying. So I'm only going to read verse 40 and 41, Acts chapter 2, verse 40 and 41. Now, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptised, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And the main expression that I'm going to spend time on is that one, be saved from this perverse generation, linking that to baptism. Now, this section of scripture, you'll probably have a title in it, something like, A Vital Church Grows. So I see this section, 40, 41, Acts 2, 40 and 41, as laying the foundation of that unity to be of one accord and to be in unity. So how can you be in unity from those who have not been saved from this perverse generation? So in Christendom today, there's a lot of places where they incorporate the things of the world into church life. <clears throat> so, so when we read this, a lot of people would think this perverse generation, they'd think of the perversion, things like, say, pornography and drugs and other things like that. But there's a perversion of truth within our culture. You think of feminism, the structure of the family, relationships and all sorts of things. So therefore, many churches I see are taking things from the culture and being culturally relevant which to me is just bringing in the perversion of the fallen world into the life of the church to make the church supposedly more relevant to a fallen world, which seems the opposite to this to me, because this says be saved from that perversion or from that understanding, which means then you're called out and separated, you're consecrated. So therefore, the church should always stand in contrast to a perverted understanding of truth within our culture and society. And yet many churches, I believe, are trying to win people over by being more like the world, which is a false idea. Now, last week, I covered 10 things about being that may be helpful for getting to the point of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've had several people, you know, prayed for people here and talk and, you know, I've been prayed for to be filled with the Holy Spirit and, you know, this and that. And so I spent a bit of time praying, Lord, what's going on? Because I've been praying for a few people who asked me to specifically. What I felt the Lord saying in response to that is that many have learned over many years, even decades, and possibly for some their whole Christian walk, of how to live their Christianity in the natural person rather than the spiritual man. And what this means is Christendom, your Christian walk can be done naturally, which means by the natural man. You're, you can bring yourself here, you can sit here, you can sing songs, you can listen to sermons, you can read your Bible, you can do any manner of thing which are spiritual, but you do it naturally, especially if you're being taught by someone. If you have gone, uh, got saved into a church where that pastor or minister is not a, a spirit-filled minister, and he himself is living a fairly natural man Christianity, then he will teach you a natural man Christianity, which is, which is doing the religion of Christianity through the natural man. So I'm not going to spend much time on it, it'd be a separate sermon, but just to think about that in regard to if you're struggling to break through into being filled with the Holy Spirit, just think about your fuller, bigger picture of your Christian life 
And do you do most of your Christian life with a natural man or the spiritual man? In Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So for those of you who this might be an issue, ask yourself the question, what do you think it means to be in the spirit? Because John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of trumpet. Now that's the beginning of the book of Revelation. But he was in the spirit to receive the revelation. So if you want to receive the gift of tongues, you need to be in the spirit, like baptised in the Holy Spirit and spiritual to be able to exercise that. If, like I, probably the word of knowledge is the strongest gift I function in. I seem to know things about people, but don't let that frighten you. Um, but I've got to be in the spirit to have that word. If I'm in the natural man, I can't hear it. So, so you've got to think then, well, have I been taught a Christianity that is so natural like we have meetings and we have buildings and we have elders and we have this, and, and there's a structure and a natural sort of nature of church, and that's what you're being in. And then all of a sudden I say, get filled with the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues and manifest the gifts. And you know, what? Can you pray for me? And it's sort of like then you sit there like as if something's going to happen to you because you don't know how to live a spiritual Christian life. So I encourage you to just think about that and we'll deal with that more as time goes on, because I think the Lord just gave that as a bit of an answer to me for some people here who may be struggling. But let's get on with our sermon. Let's be renewed in the attitude of our mind, is a scripture. Be renewed in the attitude of your mind, and specifically I was talking about toward the church, which is the body of Christ. Our loyalty and commitment is not to the conformity of a group, but to the Lord Jesus and being a faithful member of his body. Now, a lot of people will say that, a lot of people will be able to articulate that, but you've got to start to think through what's the practical reality of living that truth out, that I'm not committed to the loyalty of a group, like a consensus to this group, but I'm committed to the head, Jesus Christ, and to his body, the church, and there is only one church. So therefore, I've got to be renewed in the attitude of my mind. How do I live out my Christianity? How do I walk my Christianity out? where my sense of loyalty is not to the group and conformity to the group, but to the head and to his body, which is a bigger thing. So straight away, the first thing that comes to mind for me is how we say, which church do you go to? Or I'm going to church. They're both oxymorons. You know, they're, they're irrational questions and statements. You can't go to church for a start, and there is no division amongst one church to another. There is only one head, one body, one church, and we are the church, so I can't even go to church. But you see, that's dangerous because our language doesn't match our thinking. And if your language doesn't match your thinking, I can tell you from cultural studies that language is a powerful tool and effect in the way you live out truth. So we could be living out the truth of we are actually divided amongst ourselves. There are many different churches because we use that language. So somehow I've got to try and stop myself and say fellowship. We're having fellowship with other believers on Sunday rather than going to church. Our loyalty and commitment is not the conformity of the group, but to the Lord Jesus and being a faithful member of his body as portrayed in scripture. So we're looking to the scriptures for what that body is and how to be a loyal member of that body. So not what is taught behind many pulpits and required practice in many churches. Now, last week I went over fairly extensively and I could probably keep going about all the problems to do with that mentality of you need to be a committed member to this group, you need to have been here for a few years, you need to have demonstrated loyalty and so forth before you can do anything and then even ministry is then changed into what you do in this group. I covered a lot of that last week. That's the part I'm cutting out, so I'm going to try not to talk about it. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to go through just four passages of scripture that will help solidify the idea that the church is Christ's body in the world. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 to 16. Ephesians 4, 15 to 16. But speaking the truth in love, and boy, is that a, a comment that you know, I could just do a sermon on that. Speaking the truth in love. So love void of truth is not love. Truth void of love, well, it may be true in a half sense and in an absolute sort of sense, but it's ineffective without love. So speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. So what are we growing? If you talk about I'm growing as a Christian I'm gro and we are growing as a fellowship, how can we measure that? We are growing up into the head. 
Jesus Christ. And how do we grow? When we hear truth given to us in love. So the truth of God's word, that's why the sound interpretation of the word is so important in the life of a fellowship and in your life, because it's the truth of God's word shared with you in love that causes you to grow up into the head of Christ. And there's a, nice, there's a, there's a part of me going, I really want to emphasise, grow up. <laughs> I don't know, sometimes I felt over the years just saying to some Christians, grow up, will you? You know, just so childish in their attitude and understanding. But as, you know, we don't, we don't say that to, like our grandkids are here today, we don't say, Jonas, grow up. <laughs> like it's pointless, isn't it? You've got to deal with things where people are at. But for us who are, who are hopefully more mature, we're looking and going, truth in love, growing up into the head Christ, verse 16, from whom the whole body, so from whom, that's Christ, the whole body, one church, the universal church, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Maybe I'll come back to that one day because I'm going to get stuck here. There is so much in that. All I'm going to say, though, is because the reason I brought these out is to understand the scriptural idea that the church is the body of Christ. You, as individual members of that body, bring something to that body, and so therefore your work and ministry should be such that it edifies that same body. And when we talk about edify the body, how can we picture that? We're edifying the body into the head, growing up into the head so that the church has all that it's functioning and needs to function to edify itself up into the head Christ. Anyhow, another day. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. So Jesus is the head of the church, the church is his body, he saves the body. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. So who is to have preeminence in the church? Christ, the head, which you know from many times of me saying what you're looking for and maybe even online if people are thinking, you know, am I in the right church? Well, then the fellowship you should be having should be one that edifies the head and, and causes the body to grow up into that head. So if you're not hearing much about Jesus Christ, then you may be in the wrong place. But I would like you to turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. If you turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Colossians 1, 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Let me ask you a question. How much are you prepared to suffer for the sake of his body? And, and when I read this from Paul, he rejoices in his sufferings, being filled up, that's hopefully not me, being filled up in my flesh, so that's suffering in the flesh in the natural man, what is lacking in the affection, afflictions of Christ, what is lacking, what do you mean is the ongoing work of the ministry in the body of Christ that Paul is suffering in his natural man for the sake of the edification of the body of Christ. In other words, he's presenting himself a living sacrifice. I give up the pleasures of this life or the comfort of the natural man in order to suffer for the sake of the body. Most people today in Christendom approach the church as a place to have their needs met, which is almost the exact opposite of the attitude of Paul. Paul says, I come to the body of Christ to present myself a living sacrifice and I rejoice in the sufferings that I have that, uh, and those sufferings are filled up in my flesh for what is lacking in the affections of Christ for the sake of his body. How many people are prepared to really lay down their life and suffer for the sake of the body of Christ or the church? Yet that should be our attitude as believers. How different is Paul's attitude to the church compared to most people today? Now, that was probably just the introduction, so let's get to the text. 
Acts 2, 40, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. The core ministry of the church is to witness and testify to the truth. The Holy Spirit then taking that testimony and seeing people saved from this perverse generation, it's called in scripture, the ministry of reconciliation. So our ministry as a body to the world, so you have two avenues of ministry if you're thinking about your own ministry. You have a ministry as a part of that body to edify the body, edify itself in love, helping the church be built up into the head Christ. But then corporately and individually, we have a responsibility to testify to the world that which we know of Christ Jesus so that the Holy Spirit can take that testimony in, in, that's in the world and use that to see other people saved and added to his body as he chooses. I've often taught that we are to be saved from the wrath of God. You know that. Because in, if you read carefully Acts 2.40, it says, be saved from this perverse generation. And you know that, and I've taught before, and so you should understand that we are saved from the wrath of God and from the coming wrath of God. And that is true, but we are also then called to be saved from this perverse generation. So if you think, what am I saved? Like, remember my golfing buddy, Steve? You know, you need to be saved, you need to be saved. And he eventually turned around and said, saved from what? And I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I was a young Christian. Well, now I'd say you need to be saved from the wrath of God and you need to be saved from this perverse generation. Jeremiah verse, so I'm going to look at the heart of men. Like, so we're going to look into this a little bit, this perverse generation, and to understand how, how deep this perversion actually runs. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and is desperately wicked who can know it. So the Bible teaches that the natural heart of mankind, fallen humanity, is wicked. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I think it's right in what I've heard, and I would agree with the idea that this is probably separated. It's not the sin that causes you to fall short. You're doing both. You're sinning and you're falling short of the glory of God. And that's, that's not us, obviously, because we're saved. You know, I'm talking about unsaved, unregenerate people. But in the text, remember verse 40, be saved from this perverse generation. So if this generation, its heart is wicked, it's perverse, it's fallen, it's corrupted... Uh, it doesn't seek after righteousness, it sinned, it falls short from the glory of God. And John 8, 44, I think, sums it up for the world and all those who are outside of Christ. John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil. And we know elsewhere it says Satan is the God of this world. We know elsewhere that it says that Satan influences the nations of the world. And so mankind in his fallen state has no resistance to the influence of Satan and his demonic hordes. They, they have none. There's, there's no equipping within natural man to fight this or to resist this. The desires of your father you want to do because the desires of sinful rebellion in man, self-idolatry and Satan in his pride and hatred of God, they meet at the same point. We, we want to do what our father, the devil, does. The desires of your father you want to do. So I'm in John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. And what did we start with? The love, truth shared in love. And this is one of the key things that I see in scripture, that those who don't really want to know the truth, those who don't want to be confronted with the truth, those who don't want to change their life according to that truth, want to pursue their own truth so they can justify their own sin and be the same as their father, the devil does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, that's Satan, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own resources for he's a liar and the father of it. So if the own resources of Satan is a lie and the father of lies and our heart is so wicked and fallen, we can't find truth within our own heart. We can't even find truth in the searching of that wicked heart. So therefore, where does truth actually sit? Truth sits with God himself. And so therefore that truth has to be revealed to us and it's ultimately revealed in Jesus Christ but it's also revealed in the scriptures. That's to the world but now it has to be revealed to you personally which then comes about by the illumination of that truth to you by the Holy Spirit. Remember, so I'm talking obviously about total depravity. 
Remember that total depravity is not that mankind can do nothing good or that mankind is perpetually always 100% acting at his most evil. That's not what total depravity is talking about. Total depravity is talking about for we have acquired, sorry, remember the total depravity is not that mankind can do nothing good, for we have acquired the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mankind can do good things, but everything he does is tainted by his fallen nature. This nature is most evident in self-idolatry and rebellion against God. Total depravity also teaches that fallen humanity, mankind's heart, that is, out of the wickedness of his heart, cannot turn to God of his own accord without God's help. Now, you should all know this. I've preached this many times, but I'm laying this as a foundation to be saved from this perverse generation. John 6, 44 and 45, it says, no one can come to me. This is what Jesus said, and it's an emphatic statement. No one can come to me. John 6, 44, unless the Father who sent me draws him. You can't, can't. So when people say, you know, I want to be saved or I want to escape from hell or whatever, you can't save yourself. You, you can't turn to God. Your heart is wicked. So that's the first thing that has to be realised. My heart outside of Christ is wicked. I won't turn to God. I actually, in the natural man, want to side with Satan. So you can see then how much then as believers... Walk in the spirit and not the natural man. Your natural man wants to side with Satan. So we put that to death and we try to walk in the spirit and by God's grace and help, we can. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. But as I've always said, whenever you read this, look around it, you'll find personal responsibility. The very next verse, verse 45 says, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. In other words, he will reveal himself. They shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from me or learned from the Father comes to me. So in other words, every, so everyone, your personal responsibility then to respond to what God has done in your heart to reveal God to you. God the Father is drawing Jesus to you, showing Jesus to you, but now you have a choice. What do you do with that? You can't come to Jesus on yourself because you're a wicked heart. You seek after no righteousness. You're with your father, the devil. God does something and reveals himself to you. And now you're faced with a choice. You now have the truth revealed to you. What will you do? And those who many of us know and can testify that when we saw the truth of Jesus Christ, the natural response was just to fall to your knees and say, Lord, thank you for having mercy on me. But others hear the truth and go, no, pride, rebellion. They choose not to because they want to stay in their flesh, in their carnality. Acts 2, 40, our text. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So this means a call to repentance coming out of the wickedness of the world. So how can the body ever be in unity if so-called Christians in that body have never repented? How can, how can you actually have fellowship with unrepentant Christians? And I'm going to sort of show you that if they're unrepentant, they're probably not Christian. Now, let's go back. I'm going to build on some things I've been teaching you recently. So hopefully we've got enough now to go a little bit further. In Mark chapter 1, I'll just remind you of some of it. In Mark chapter 1, verse 4, John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So remember how I've taught that John's baptism is the same baptism pre the cross and post the cross. They're the same baptism because it literally says John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So this means those who were baptized into John's baptism had their sins remitted for the future hope of the one to come. Now, when John's ministry came to an end, Jesus took up the same message and the same baptism, which I haven't pointed out before, but let's have a quick look at it. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 and 17. Matthew 4, 12 and 17. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. Okay, so the context now, John has been put into prison. And then in verse 17, it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, the same message that John had baptism of repentance 
But he's added something here, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why is the kingdom of heaven at hand? Because the Messiah is here. Jesus is here. God is now incarnate. So the message from John the Baptist, that's why he prepared the way. A baptism of repentance for the remission of your sins in preparation for the coming of the kingdom, which is now in Christ Jesus. But Jesus, when John finished, picked up the same message, which is a message of repentance. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14. And, yes, that was Matthew 4, 12 and 17. This is Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So understand what's happening. It says that Jesus picked up John's ministry. Until John stopped preaching, then Jesus picked up that ministry and that baptism and continued it. So, but he added to it the kingdom of God because the kingdom is now come with Jesus Christ. Verse 15, so Mark 1, 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So Jesus Christ himself and his disciples preached repentance. Now, this is important because a lot of people don't picture Jesus this way. They sort of picture Jesus as the one who just comes in all loving grace to just give blessing. But Jesus himself said, repent. He picked up John's message and he picked up John's baptism, which is a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. One looks forward and we're going to look backwards. Now, it is significant that Jesus never baptised anyone. You remember this, that Jesus didn't baptise anyone. His disciples did. That's in John 4, 1 and 2. Though Jesus himself did not baptise, but his disciples did. So now picture what's happening. John is baptising people. Baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He's now been put in prison and about to have his head cut off. And Jesus now starts his ministry and picks up the same preaching, which is a baptism of repentance. So you can see in the text quite clearly that John's ministry and John's baptism is the same baptism that Jesus' disciples performed. It's the same thing. But it is also significant that when John finished his preaching, and he finished that by going into prison and having his head cut off, that Jesus took up the same message. This means John's preaching and John's baptism is the same as the baptism performed by Jesus' disciples. Let that sink in a little bit. This is really important. And if you agree or disagree, obviously, if you disagree, let's have a chat later. Now, John directly challenged the... So if that's the case, I'm now going to look at something that happened with John and the John's baptism that still applies to our baptism and the message that Jesus preached and his disciples, the baptism that they performed. Because John directly challenged the false baptism of the religious hypocrites in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. You may want to turn to this, Matthew 3, 7. Now, I know we have been over this, but I'm giving it a slightly different slant, and we're going to look at the consequences of this understanding. So I'm in Matthew 3, 7. So when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, Luke, if you turn to Luke, it's going to give us a a fuller understanding of what's going on here. Luke chapter 3, verse 7 to 20. You know, I've joked before. You remember this section, brood of vipers. That's a good way to preach and get a crowd, isn't it? You know, treating people like that. But these are the religious hypocrites. And I notice in Scripture that whenever they're trying to get through, Jesus or John or whoever, the time, trying to get through to religious hypocrites, they use powerful language. You brood of vipers! You know, to snap them out of their sort of slumber or something. Wake up, you brood of vipers! You think you're going to be saved because you've been baptised? Show work worthy of that baptism. Repentance worthy of that. So he challenged them. But the others, humble, grace, provision. So in Luke chapter 3, verse 7, then he said to the multitudes that came to him, they noticed between the other one it was the Pharisees and Sadducees, but in this one it's the crowd, the multitudes, the people. He said to the multitudes that came out to be baptised by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now we're going to see why he's doing this, because in Luke 3, 8, he says why. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. 
So in other words, your repentance is false and your baptism is false if there is no repentance. Because he goes on to say, do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. Now I can change that to our context. Do not say to yourself that I went to an altar call and put up my hand. Show me fruit worthy of the so-called repentance. Otherwise, your baptism may be false and you're deceived and deluded. Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Verse 9, and even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So what is he saying here? The tree that bears, that comes up and does not bear fruit, good fruit. What good fruit are we talking about? The fruit of repentance. So in other words, if you repent and turn away from the, what are we being saved from? This perverse generation. So if you don't turn away from that perverse generation and show fruits worthy of that supposed repentance, then it says the axe is ready at the root of the tree. Now, this is obviously also an expression to Israel, but I think you can take it personally. Therefore, every tree which does not bear the good fruit suitable for repentance shall be cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, of course, which is a sensible thing to do, okay, we don't want to be thrown into the fire. We've come out here to be baptised. You're telling us something's wrong with our attitude towards repentance. What shall we do then? Okay, because there's religious hypocrites who come for the ceremony of baptism. Now, listen to me. If the ceremony of baptism could say, then I might as well go back to my Catholic heritage. Why? Because we baptise babies on that emphasis. That the ceremony or the ritual or the magic tradition of baptism somehow saves somebody. So you being baptized, that baptism is not some magic ritual that saves you. That's what the Catholics believe. So if you got baptized without repentance, then you were not baptized. You were just getting washed from some sweat. Your sins weren't being washed away because there's no repentance. So your baptism is false if there's no repentance. So the people said to him, what shall we do? And he answered and said to them, verse 11, he answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then tax collectors came also to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed to you. Verse 14, likewise, the soldiers also asked saying, what shall we do? So he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. Now, in all of that, please, I hope you understand, do not confuse what I just read with religious good works. See, now, if you're not in the spirit, if the Holy Spirit's not illuminating this to you and you're in the natural man, you'll read this and go, well, I I give, I give clothes to the poor, I give food, I don't intimidate people, I don't steal, tick, 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 I'm a good, therefore I have repentance, I have good fruit, I'm saved and my baptism is real. No, no. No, you have misunderstood it. These are very specific people who are doing these very specific things that he's saying in your life, tax collector, stop stealing from people. In your life, soldier, stop intimidating people and bearing false witness because your sergeant major says to, which is like the police force today, don't be a corrupt policeman. Don't be stealing the government with false tax returns. Don't lie to people. Don't steal. Don't cheat. Let the truth of God's life in you be manifest. So don't confuse this with religious self-effort because otherwise then baptism is still not worth anything because all you've done is then rely upon yourself to be a better version of yourself. You'll hear Joel Olstein preach that. Be the be a best version of yourself. That's all God wants. Just be the best version of yourself. And you can take what I just read and use it in that preaching out of its context. Do not confuse this with a religious self-effort to be a better version of yourself, even though the progress of sanctification is by the work of the Spirit within you. You still need to be an active participant in the process. Why? Okay, I'm going to give you, and I'm going to answer that question right now. Why? Why do I need to be an active participant in this process? I can't just sit back and say, well, it's not, it's not me making a good version of myself, so I'm just going to do nothing and let the Lord do it. No, that's false too. Well, I'm going to launch out and be a really good person. No, you've missed it as well. All right, see how fine some of these lines are. So the Holy Spirit within, born again, he now manifests his nature in you. 
but you still have to then work in cooperation with what he's prompting you to do. Peter still had to preach, didn't he? And the people still had to witness. They still had to respond. So you still have to respond. 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16, Therefore gird up, gird up the loins, loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1, 13. So we found it on, remember, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Rest your hope firmly upon the grace that was brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you're not building religious good works. You're not building a better version of yourself. He has to work that good work in you and you have to cooperate with the good work he does. Verse 14, as obedient children. So therefore we have to be obedient. Not religious self-work, not being saved by good works, but we're entering into the repentance and the true fruit of our salvation by being obedient children. 1 Peter 1, 14. As obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lusts, which matches our verse. Be saved from this perverse generation. I've now been saved out of that generation, so no longer be conformed to the thinking and the pattern of that former lust that the world follows. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. So why? Because God is holy. Not because I'm earning God's favour, not because he's unhappy with me when I don't make it, or not because I need to for him to bless me or any of that sort of rubbish. If I'm born again and saved, I've seen Jesus Christ and I know who he is and I know what he's done. So therefore, my response is, Lord, here is my life. So then if I say to the Lord, here is my life, then he says, be holy as I am holy. So what's my motivation? My motivation is God. You are my Lord and you are holy. So therefore, I desire to be holy. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So we've got be obedient children, keep the commandments of the Lord. You are not free to just do whatever you want. And this is where the Christian preaching or that false gospel message, these are the religious hypocrites that came down to John, went through the waters of baptism, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the wrath to come. Show me the fruit of that so-called repentance. So all these Christians running around who have been baptised and going to church, but they're not repentant, they are not saved because they haven't even been baptised because their baptism is false. That's what this is saying. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. This is in the Great Commission. So our job is teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So we're to teach in our discipling others, obey the commands of the Lord. So there is obedience. Let's get back to Luke chapter 3, picking it up at verse 15. Luke 3, 15. Remember, this is John the Baptist. We're looking at the false baptism. Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptise you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. All right, so we've been through this. All four Gospels record the message of John the preaching of John is that there's one coming after me who's mightier than I who will baptise you in the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, but a lot of people like to stop there, but I'm not going to. Let's go to verse 17. His winnowing fan is in his hand. Now, this is to fan the flame of the fire and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing, threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. You couldn't get any clearer in the context that this brood of vipers, the crowd, the people who are coming to him and wanting to be baptised without repentance are going to be burned up like chaff. So their baptism doesn't save them. Why? Because there is no repentance in their baptism. So true baptism has to be empowered by repentance, true repentance, and then show fruit worthy of that repentance. So in context, this verse is talking about the chaff being burned in unquenchable fire False water baptism is a baptism that contains no repentance. False water baptism is a baptism that contains no repentance. So if you just went through a ritual to flee hell, you may not be saved. There has to be a heartfelt change that I'm turning away from the things that God hates and turning to the things that he loves because I'm now his. 
Let's get back to Luke again, chapter 3, verse 18 now. And with many other exhortations he preached to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother, Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done. So not just his, the, the woman, but also all the evils which he had done. In other words, John the Baptist was confronting him with his sin, calling him to join the crowd, repent of your sins and be baptised. Verse 20, also added this above all that he shut John in prison. All right, so what I'm going to pick up on now is that the leaders of John's day were offended at John for pointing out their sins. And they put him in prison and beheaded him for it. John was killed for doing this. Jesus was crucified by the hatred of men toward God for pointing out their sin. John 7.7, 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. So here we have John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. John is testifying, repent of your evil deeds, gets put in prison and has his head cut off. Jesus comes and says, repent, the same message, repent from your evil deeds. And he points out their sin. You need to turn from your sin and repent. And he's crucified for it. So when the gospel is void of repentance from sin and false beliefs, it is not the gospel. Both John and Jesus with his disciples preached a water baptism. Remember John's baptism and the message, the same as Jesus' disciples. It's the same message. It's the same baptism. Just one's on one side of the cross and the other's on the other side. Both John and Jesus with his disciples preached a water baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, if we can't get this right, then we have no basis for unity in the church. This is foundational. This is just, just like ground level rock. So if we're, we're trying to be in fellowship with other Christians who, who haven't repented or don't understand repentance, they're not really Christian because they haven't been baptised in the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And if they think the gospel is about something else, then we can't actually have fellowship. No matter how much we try to be in unity, we can't be in unity because it's different. Remember, the unity is not a false unity of bringing everything down to the lowest common denominator. It's a unity that can only be experienced in the spirit, in true salvation, the true Holy Spirit. So I'm going to make a statement, which hopefully now with you guys here, I can get this because the lines here are so finely divided, it can often be misunderstood. Repentance, faith, and baptism. And if you're taking notes, write this down. Repentance, faith, and baptism are all linked. Repentance, faith, and baptism are all linked. Now, I've just showed you a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Repentance and baptism linked. Repentance, faith, and baptism are all linked. So when I've made the comment before, saved by grace through faith in Christ, you can't drop baptism. You can't drop repentance because it's connected to faith. If you understand the statement properly, by grace, through faith, you then have to understand what biblical faith is and it's not a faith void of repentance. So therefore, repentance, faith and baptism are all linked. Now, what that means is if they are all linked, and I'm going to continue to show you that I believe that they are, if they're all linked, the scriptures don't separate them from each other. Um, so that means if you don't repent, you have no faith and baptism. If you have no faith, you have no repentance and baptism. And if you have no baptism, you have no repentance and faith. You can't separate them. Now, that's going to take, maybe that's a good discussion point for the home groups, like, because if you're thinking, surely we can cut this up and separate these. But so, in other words, the three of them come as a package. And if you take one out, you don't have the others. Just as we have seen the baptism without repentance, because we've seen that, I've shown that to you, baptism without repentance voids the baptism. So too, faith without obedience is void of faith. Now, I haven't got time to go through it fully, but it's in James chapter 2. I'll give you some of them. James chapter 2, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? And the rhetorical question is, no, it cannot. Cognitive ascent into the reality of Jesus does not save you. But you need to know who Jesus is. You need to know what Jesus has done. You need to have knowledge. You need to hear the proposition. But the proposition itself and belief in that proposition doesn't save. 
can faith save him? Verse 17, James 2, 17. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So therefore, baptism without repentance is dead work. James 2, 24. You see then that a man is justified by works. Now, you don't hear that preached too often. Why? Because people misinterpret it. This is the fine lines you have to understand. It is, he is not saying saved by good works like, you, like most people would think of it. We go back to our list with John. Don't steal, don't oppress people, don't lie. Don't do all these good things and you'll be right. That's salvation by works. And that's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is you don't have faith unless there's a work that we can see comes out of that faith. And John is saying the same thing. You brood of vipers who warned you to flee the come, wrath to come, show fruit worthy of this so-called repentance. You, you've been baptised, you say you repent, I want to see it now. And this is the same as what James is saying. If you say you have faith, I want to see it. Show the work that comes from that faith. Don't just give me the words, put it into action. Live that faith. Verse 26, James 2, 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without work is also dead. So therefore, we go back to the idea that I put forward to you. Repentance, faith and baptism are all linked and you can't have one without the other. So faith without the work of baptism isn't faith. So therefore, when I say saved by grace through faith in Christ, that faith, if you, have, if you say you have faith and yet you do not have the work of baptism, you are not saved. Now you think, hold on, does baptism say? No, because then we're back to the Catholic thinking. They're linked together. Repentance, faith and baptism are linked together. You can't separate them. Now, I'll get to what's coming up in your mind, hopefully. Baptism, baptism in, is always portrayed in Scripture as the way for salvation by faith to be acquired. Baptism is always portrayed in Scripture as the way that salvation by faith is acquired. Many cite the thief on the cross that I don't need to be baptised. I'm going to have a look at, at it and hopefully by the end of this you'll realise why you can't do that. Many cite the thief on the cross as an example of salvation without baptism. And it's about the only scripture I've ever heard people use in some way to try and justify I'm saved without baptism. This thief may well have been baptised in John's baptism. You cannot say that that thief was not baptised. Now that you understand that John's baptism is the same baptism as Jesus, there's every chance that that man had been baptised into John's baptism. And I'm going to give you... So, you, so for a start, even if I don't go any further, you now can't use it as a justification. Why? Because now you look at it and go, we don't actually know whether he wasn't baptised. He may have been baptised, so therefore it's void. Now, if you could be saved without baptism, that would be a teaching somewhere. It would be a teaching. That, that, that idea that baptism is an outward expression of an inner conversion makes it some sort of optional extra. It's not an optional extra. Nowhere in Scripture is it presented that way. And it's not taught that way anywhere. So people then use this one obscure text where there's supposedly a man on the cross who's being saved without baptism, and now I'm telling you he may have been baptised. So you can't use that. This thief may well have been baptised into John's baptism, meaning there is no guarantee that he was not baptised. His comment to Jesus indicates prior knowledge that he was brought, that, that, and that knowledge now brought to life in the realisation that, hold on, this guy hanging beside me might be the Messiah that John was talking about. See the difference? He's on a cross, dying, having been baptised in the baptism of repentance in John's baptism for the future one who would come, the anointed one, the Messiah, and with all that's going on, he's sort of, is he the Christ? So hence he says in Luke 23, 42, then he said to Jesus, Lord, okay, he's looking for the Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Nothing that was being said around that cross would have taught him anything about the kingdom. So therefore he knows something about the coming Messiah and the coming kingdom. And he's gone, hold on, this is the Messiah. Lord, remember me when you come into the kingdom. I reckon this guy had been baptised into John's baptism. Verse 43, and Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise, which means you cannot use this verse to say that people can go to heaven and into paradise without being baptised. And now go back to what I was saying. Hold on, aren't you, aren't you putting too much emphasis on baptism? You can't separate baptism from faith and repentance. They're a package deal. 
Baptism without true repentance, as we saw in John, was a false baptism. Faith without works is a dead faith. The work of faith is obedience, and we've seen that time and time, obedience. And what is the command all through Scripture? Believe and be baptised. Even when the Holy Spirit was poured out and the Gentiles spoke in tongues, he didn't say, well, God's now confirmed you that you're Christians, you're now speaking in tongues and you're baptised in the Holy Spirit, don't worry about it, you're all good. What did he say? He said to them, go, he commanded them, go and be baptised. Everywhere you read through and teach, you'll see they always said, be baptised. Those who are saved and are baptised shall be saved. And you cannot separate baptism from faith and repentance. That is so different than faith is this optional extra and outward expression of an inner conversion. That is garbage. I remember another place I found all these books with that in it. I just grabbed them and threw them in the bin. It's just rubbish. Now, thinking though more fully about this criminal on the cross, because remember, repentance needs to be a part of the baptism and conversion. His crimes may have been committed before his baptism. We don't know. But even if after his baptism, it's not evidence of unrepentant baptism or a false baptism. Because when we talk about repentance, we're not talking about sinless perfection. So he can still fall and make a mistake and get caught for it and end up crucified and still have a baptism of repentance. Or he could have sinned beforehand before he was even baptised. Who knows? So we have no record that all the believers... Now, this is I'm going to answer a question I got you to discuss a while back. We have no record in the Scriptures that all believers that were baptised into John's baptism had to be rebaptized again into Jesus Christ. This would be significant and most likely recorded. And it would then have to be a teaching somewhere. If you think about all the multitude that went out to John... To be baptised, and remember, it's the same language, baptism of repentance for what? The remission of sins. The only difference then is here's Jesus on the cross. They're being baptised in repentance for the remission of sins, looking forward to the cross. We're being baptised in a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, looking back to the cross. So now because he has risen, we can be baptised into Christ. They can't be baptised into Christ yet because Christ hasn't died and risen. But theirs is the same baptism in ours, looking in different ways. That's why when he died, the graves were opened. Those who had been baptised in repentance for the remission of sins, when Jesus died, the rocks split, the graves were opened, and many who had died in Christ were seen. They're the ones who were baptised into John's baptism. Okay, so now you're getting it. It's sort of like, oh, I'm starting to get this. So we have no record that all these people, like the disciples and all the Jesus' disciples who they baptised, that they were re-baptised. Now, there's one example of re-baptism and, oh, you're kidding me. We're going to try and look at it in six minutes. Let's have a quick look. Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to 6. Now, I'll do check Acts chapter 8 and 19 one day more fully, but I just want to touch on something because some of you may be aware of this re-baptism. In Acts chapter 19, verse 1 to 6, verse 1, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. All right, so Apollos is the one who gave them wrong teaching. Apollos is going off to, back to Corinth to check on what Aquila and Priscilla had told him. Paul happens across these believers that uh, were taught by Apollos. And in verse 2, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, that sounds like uh, if we believe in Jesus, we receive all the fullness of the Holy Spirit at our conversion. But that's not really what he's saying. Because they said to him, we have not so much as heard where there is a Holy Spirit. Now, this is important. You may have missed this in the past. This is important because John's preaching, John's preaching was not just based about repentance only, but also faith in the one to come who would baptise them in the Holy Spirit. So think of it, John's. if you went down to the river to be baptised by John, you would have heard John's preaching. Every gospel records this, that he testified that there's one who comes after me, who's mightier than I, whose sandal straps I'm not worthy, he will baptise you in the Holy Spirit. So therefore being baptised of repentance for the remission of sins into John's came with the teaching of the one to come. So if they say to him, we have not so much heard whether there is a Holy Spirit, means they have false understanding. They do not understand John's baptism, even though they're saying we were baptised into John because John preached a particular message that they clearly don't understand. 
So this is important because John's preaching was not just based about repentance only, but also faith in the one to come who would baptize them in the Holy Spirit. So anyone correctly taught by John would have known that John's baptism of repentance contained the hope in the one to come. Verse 3, and he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, now he corrects them because he goes, John indeed baptized. So yes, John's baptism. John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, as we know, baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. But this is what he was saying to the people. This is what Paul goes on to saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So if all they've got is half the message, we're being baptised for the repentance and remission of sins, but we don't know about the Holy Spirit. We don't know about... If they don't know about the Holy Spirit, it means they don't know about Christ. They're not looking forward to the coming Messiah, the one who would deliver them from their sin ultimately. But it gets a bit deeper than this. This belief in the one to come was part of John's preaching. This means their baptism, as they understood it, was into John and not into the hope of the one to come. Their baptism was a false baptism because they had faith in the wrong thing. False or incorrect teaching or incomplete teaching. Now, faith in the wrong teaching does not lead to salvation. Faith in the wrong teaching does not lead to salvation. So just because you're in a church or just because you've heard a particular message and a guy says, I'm a Christian, I'm a pastor, and he holds up a Bible, doesn't necessarily mean that you're being saved by the truth. You could have false teaching and being led astray and God's under no obligation to save you. Faith in the wrong teaching does not lead to salvation. Now, unfortunately, many preachers today present God as an all-loving God who affirms the choices that people make teaching that his love is looking for people to be true to themselves, this teaching would find it absolutely abhorrent that God would reject people and cast them into hell on the basis of faith in false teaching. And you can see why it's not popular. Why? Because we want to attract people. We want people to be happy. We want the world to be happy with us. It's all about love. So when you hear it's all about love... There's a danger then that they're not an understanding that if you don't have this right, if you're not baptised by true repentance and the fruit of true repentance with actual faith into the actual Christ, you are not saved. Oh, that's not loving. It's all about love. Just accept people and affirm people. You see why that love message is so dangerous. So too many could be having faith in false teaching today, being baptised in that teaching but having no true salvation. He goes on, then Paul said, John indeed baptised with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So he's confirming what I'm saying. Paul is confirming that John's preaching was, have faith in the one to come, Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, now this is not showing a difference between John's baptism and the baptism of Jesus. They are not different because of this text. The difference here stems from which side of the cross, as I've explained. They're now going to be baptised into Christ Jesus, not John's baptism. Why? Because this is 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus. That's the other problem with this. How on earth has Apollos, 15 years after Jesus rose from the dead, still getting this wrong? So he was corrected by Aquila and Priscilla and he's gone back to Corinth to, to check that, that he needs to be corrected. Because what he taught these people is wrong. So he's creating, Apollos was creating a whole heap of false converts because of an incomplete teaching and he needed to be corrected. So Paul was coming down to correct these people and Apollos was being corrected by others. They had not known the ways of John's baptism correctly and so the baptism they had received was not baptism at all. Also, they may have been baptised into John's baptism many years after Jesus had died and risen again. Now, as I've said, Acts 19 is approximately 50 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus and after the day of Pentecost. So by this time, Apollos should have been teaching a different message. He should have been preaching faith in the risen Christ and a baptism of repentance into him. So this is about false teaching 15 years later to a bunch of people who were baptised even wrongly into the baptism of John because they had no comprehension of the Christ Jesus to come and the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So they were not saved. 
So therefore, we have nothing then in Scripture that indicates that those who are baptised into John's baptism needed to be baptised again into Christ Jesus. And I'm going to put to you that all those that were baptised prior to the cross with a baptism of repentance into John's baptism are in Christ Jesus because they put their faith in the coming Christ, the Messiah, which was part of John's teaching. Jesus then picked up that same teaching and his disciples picked up the very same teaching and continued to preach a baptism of repentance for the one to come, which is now Jesus. And hence the guy hanging on the cross that could have well been baptised in John looked and realised, you're the Christ, you're the Messiah. So in all likelihood, that thief on the cross had been baptised. And I think it then stands that you cannot separate faith, repentance and baptism from each other. They need to be included. So now I know that there's some of you here have not been baptised and you've not been baptised, and if you look at your life and you think, I was baptised, but I certainly didn't repent of anything, let me just warn you, your baptism may not be real if you did not repent. And if you haven't been baptised, you're in danger because everywhere in the Bible it teaches you repent and be baptised. Okay, I know I've gone over now, there's no need to mute me. <laughs> okay, I'm on my last page and last verse, let me pick it up. They now had to be baptised correctly, or should I say true faith in the true gospel message that empowered their baptism of repentance demonstrated in obedience to the command to be baptised now into the risen Christ. And then he goes on, and when Paul laid his hands on them, once all this baptism and salvation had been corrected, then Paul laid his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Everywhere you'll hear the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you will see a visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And I know some of you are wanting that visible manifestation in your life, but there are gifts besides tongues and that that you may see as well. We'll get on to it. But for tongue, can I just, yeah, look, let me just do it. <laughs> tongues for me. Remember how I said that some of you have lived a natural Christian life and you're learning how to be walk in the Spirit. Speaking in tongues for me really helps me with that because when I first spoke in tongues, the natural man would go, that is ridiculous, what are you doing? So then I said to the natural man, get, get, like, get away from me. No, this is in scripture, this is what the Lord says, this is a gift and this is given to me by the Holy Spirit and I kept speaking in tongues. The more I spoke in tongues, the more I learned how to be in the Spirit. And so that's that tongue, speaking in tongues to yourself, edifying yourself up in your most holy life. In, in faith, it's for you. You're speaking a heavenly language to God and you're trusting the spirit and you're speaking in the spirit to God. You're being in the spiritual man. Now think about John. When John said he was in the spirit and he got the revelation, the book of Revelation, he was in the spirit and the things that he saw. So I'm in the spirit speaking in tongues. It's biblical. It's only Satan and the false teaching in the world and the fear and whatever else that goes on that causes people to fear that. And it is a powerful tool for you to learn how to be in the spirit. And Christianity is to be lived in the spirit, not the natural man and not the flesh. So verse six, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Let me pray. Lord, I pray that as we continue to grow in our faith and our understanding, that whatever's in us that's of the natural man and holding us back, we pray deliver us from it and renew our mind and our attitude towards the wonderful gift of your Holy Spirit and the fruit of repentance in our life. Anyone here, Lord Jesus, that's been convicted about a lack of repentance or a lack of faith or baptism, I pray that you'll provide a way for them to move forward in their relationship with you. I commit everybody to you, Lord Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen.